The big question is, can I finish the last pop tart before this theme song ends? Just managed to scarf down that last pop tart okay, and you are listening to All Hell Can't Stop Us, the 2010s Decade in Review Show. I am Jeff Cliff, and I have been recording this podcast, if this is the first you've heard of it, or the first you've seen of it, every week for the past, what, 43, 44 weeks, minus one week where I just decided to take the week off. So this has been kind of like a weekly tradition, but there are other traditions in my life uh, and that I do try to keep my life regular with, including looking back at the end of the year to see what happened in the last year, what things could be improved, what things were important to remember, and so on and so forth. And in addition to that, I do try, as the decades end, to try to look back on the last kind of five years, the last 10 years, because the, the decade, even though it's kind of arbitrary, it's a convenient place to mark, to look kind of further back, to look further into the past than just one year. And this is something that's been kind of annoying me uh, this whole week, as I've been getting emails from groups that have been around for about, or for longer than a decade, like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, by the way, good organization, well worth your donations. The Free Software Foundation, again, another good organization, although there's some uh, current political difficulties this year, but I'm not going to talk all that much about that. But groups like that have been around for a long time. The Free Software Foundation and the GNU Project have been around since like 1984. That's almost as old as I am. That's almost 40 years now. The EFF has been around, I think, since the early 1990s. So they have been around and they have a long, long history to draw back on and to talk about the current context. And when I say current context, I mean the context of the past decade, which is deeper and broader than the context of the year. For example, Donald Trump was a public figure a decade ago, but he wasn't the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, snark, snark. This is something that has changed. And over the long run, people like the only thing that's really notable about him is his challenges on the checks of power, his uh, actually, we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the various things maybe where he is important. But long story short, the way things look at the 10 year point of view is different from the, the year point of view. It really is. And as I've been going through and checking my notes, this becomes more and more clear because over the there have been very important things that have happened in the past 10 years. And in a video like this, I do not have the time to discuss it. And really, really important things. Uh, just to, to briefly mention one, one thing I will not be talking about in this video is Bitcoin. And for those of you who know me, you probably understand and appreciate how just enormously important that has been to my past 10 years. But that is the last I'm probably going to speak of it, at least in this video. Anyway, so the EFF and the the Free Software Foundation have not so far produced a 10-year review. 
Now, of course, they're charities, they're NGOs, like they only have a fixed amount of resources to do that kind of thing. But they did manage to get a yearly review going. And so, I mean, credit for them to taking the time out of their busy schedules to, to do that sort of thing. But the the point is that they could have done something a little bit deeper and a little bit more meaningful this this time around. They still have a couple of days to do it. They could even do it like a couple of days after a couple of weeks or even a couple of years, who knows, after the fact. As long as we can keep this longer term perspective available to us. And that's kind of what I'm trying to kind of get at here. Uh, there's the Long Now Foundation, which if you haven't heard of the Long Now Foundation, I think I'm going to include a link to them. Uh, but they've been around for a while. Uh, Actually, they should probably do a 10-year review too, although maybe 10 years is too short for them. That's kind of their style, is to think on the really, really long term. And that I appreciate that intent. And so I do try to live it and to be an example of someone who kind of thinks on those scales when it's possible to. Obviously, it's not always possible to. There have been many periods of time in the past 10 years in my life where I've just been able to think about like the next week or the next day, where is my next meal going to come from, that sort of thing. But when it's possible, when we have things like Pop-Tarts to put into our bellies and things like a, a roof over our head and the warmth enough to like survive at least with a blanket around us, at least we have the chance to just look back at the past couple of years and to say, well, what was important? What in the future should we take from this? When we look back at the end of the century, what should we remember about these past 10 years? And so, starting kind of at the, the least important, <laughs> is that there were a bunch of laws passed. There were a bunch of social trends. There were changes in the technology involved that led to one thread specifically exemplified this for me, but it was a broader trend. And that is, there was a thread in, I think it was Packer News, where I wanted to make a point in this conversation. And what the point was is not all that important. I linked to a song. Now, this wasn't my song. It was a Creative Commons song, so I could share it freely on the internet or anywhere else. The license of the song permitted this. But everyone in the thread was so afraid to click on this link and to listen to this song that, from what I can tell, nobody did. And sure, I didn't check the logs deeply enough to see if anyone secretly did. But at least in public, at least to the extent that they were willing to comment on, there was a crowd full of what were effectively strangers and... Every single one of them was afraid to listen to a song. Silence is the result when we're afraid to listen to music. I have lived in silence for a good part, not a majority of the time, perhaps but enough of the past couple of years to realize that people who live in fear of music, of listening to the wrong kind of music, of listening to unlicensed or pirate music, or music that they have to purchase, perhaps, when they can't really afford to listen to music. To me, this is a growing trend over the past decade. And at first it seemed like it was just a odd couple of people, perhaps. Maybe there was just some people who get the short end of the stick and who can't afford music. But just the way that technology is evolving, we are cutting people out of being, of having music in their lives at all. And the consequence of this is when they do get access to music, there's something in them that craves it. There's something in them that needs music. There's something in them that, as a human being, responds to music. And yet, that part of you, that part of a human being, does seem to take practice to, and exposure to, to fully develop. And so the RIAA and the majors have been able to get away with producing things that are musical, that appeal to these people who have been basically locked out of the world of music. Uh, and that's okay, I guess, that they at least have that. But it does seem that the quality of music itself has degraded a little bit because of this in some places. Uh, in other places, in another context, there's just as much creativity and just as much magic 
and talent and, and research and, and depth of, of music as there has ever been, if not more. But the world is kind of splitting into these two kind of sides. And I really worry about the next decade, the next century, if the RA and Microsoft and all these these various entities who have as their kind of a, as an interest in stopping the spread of culture and stopping people from enjoying music and being able to have access to culture and access to music, that they do have some successes. The battles are still being fought. The war is not over. This does not have to go this way fully or even more than it currently is. But it's something that's on the horizon that we can avoid, that we can act now to prevent. And it's something that I think is going to be one of the defining parts of when we look back on this decade. That's what we're going to see. We're going to see people afraid to listen to music and the consequences of listening to nothing and just living in silence. So with that in mind, I have no guests today. And as promised, I do have some songs for you to enjoy, some Creative Commons songs. And there are two here. The first one was recommended. It was actually, there was an instrument recommended to me. And I'm just going to go on a little bit of a tangent here. It was recommended by my boss who had heard of them and was wondering if I had heard of them. And it turned out I had not. And the instrument is called a hang drum. And it is a proprietary instrument uh, that was only manufactured for a short period of time. They kind of invented it something around the year 1999 or 2000. So it's actually a new instrument, really conceptually a little bit different than all the instruments before. Like there's obvious similarities and uh, it was inspired by the instruments that had come before it, but it really did bring some new things to the table which is kind of cool, although not really in this decade. But they did work on it, and they the first versions of it were, I mean, kind of cool, the new sound, but there were flaws. But over the, the decade of 1999 through about 2007, they fixed the flaws, or at least most of them, and made it better and better. And you can hear people perform using these, these devices, and they just sound beautiful. And I have a song, uh, one of the, the best ones, or the best one I think I found on YouTube, which just happens to be on Creative Commons, which is awesome. And so this is a song by Maddie DeWalt and Jonathan Heaven. It's got a, a title, but the title is kind of a bullshit title. So uh, I'm just going to play it and then hopefully you enjoy. And then after that, there's a Kevin McLeod, a Cryptic Sorrow. And I'd heard of Kevin McLeod before. I was actually going to play one of his songs in the last episode or, or two. But he came up as, as one of the people who plays this uh, hang drum. So that was kind of cool to see a second context where this Kevin McLeod artist is, is kind of known for. So I'll, hopefully you'll enjoy these two songs and uh, catch you after the musical break. Thank you. 
and again it was Kevin McLeod's Cryptic Sorrow, which I kind of like it. It's uh, definitely there was a whole bunch of comments on the original video that were kind of funny. It seems like they the song is is meant to kind of celebrate a particularly frustrating and oppressive time in one's life. I think it kind of does that very well. So some of the example comments under this, quote, when you buy scissors in a package that you need scissors to open, that's the song, yeah. And quote, when you're animating and haven't saved yet and the program stops responding, again, yeah. Nailed it. Definitely have the right idea there. And quote, when the internet goes down. And that's that's kind of what I wanted to kind of bring out here because that has been something that has happened over the past decade or so is that a huge parts of humanity have had the internet kind of just ripped from them when it was convenient for the powers that be to just deny everyone access to everyone else and to deny millions of people access to information and the ability to read the things they were reading, to learn about the things they're interested in, to communicate with the rest of the world, to have something, some means of communication with the rest of humanity. And that has been something that the, this decade is going to be known forever for, at least as long as humanity is around and willing to remember it. Then, of course, the previous one, that I, I just think it's such a beautiful song, that hang drum, a song by Maddie DeWalt and Jonathan Heaven. Beautiful, beautiful voice. I hope it, it came through. But this kind of leads to a point worth making in that one of the things keeping us from listening to music more than what we really should be is the streaming technology in our life has been designed from day one to prevent competitors of the RAA from being able to broadcast to their fans. Facebook did not have to have the specific noise cancellation algorithm that it uses. It, there are probably technical reasons why they did this too, but you can bet one of the main reasons is going to be that like Apple before them, when Apple created a means for people to listen to music uh, and re record audio, the RIA put the thumb screws on Apple and forced them to neuter their microphones so that they would not be able to have high definition, high fidelity musical recordings. You can bet the same thing happened at Facebook. This was Facebook is old enough to have experienced those pressures in the days before widespread ubiquitous high quality microphones. And the fact that their noise cancellation still cuts out music is a testament to that fact and to it and to that era, the previous decade, of course, uh, when the RIA was suing hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people, and trying to keep people from sharing culture and sharing music and providing alternative forms of communication that allowed for musicians who were not in their banner under their tent to reach their fans without their permission. That was a threat to their business model and one that they successfully navigated through legal and technological measures such as the Facebook noise cancellation algorithm. And so what else was going on though that over the past 10, 10 years? One of the things that happened is that I, Jeff Cliff personally got a degree. That was a big thing for me personally. I had been working on a degree up until that point for around, oh, let me think, hold on, uh, eight years. Yeah, I think it was about just under eight years that I had been working on it. And of course, before that in high school and elementary school, we're all kind of like a lead up to that point, uh, to a point where the piece of paper got printed, where my name was on it, saying that I actually know something about the world and the universe, maybe, or at least know where my ignorance lies. Of course, it doesn't say that exactly, it says something else, but that is basically what it means, is that all of that effort succeeded in producing an outcome, that it wasn't just a total and utter waste of time, money, sweat, blood, stress, tears, and you name it. That was something that uh, was a big deal in my life, and there was a lot of worry that went into whether or not it would actually happen. And the last couple of classes, by 2010, I was pretty close to being done. Like, I had, I thought I was done, in fact. <laughs> it was kind of a, I had reached the end of the, the long trail of getting the degree and had really only to get a couple of classes at the end. Uh, and then by the end, one class specifically, it didn't even matter which one it was, it was just like a general uh, three credit hour course. Which is, of course, amusing because prior to that, I had avoided crossing a picket line and wound up failing out of a semester worth of classes, including some classes I would have passed, which would have enabled me to have graduated sooner. And as part of the 
agreement with the university. I agreed that they really didn't hold me back, but on the flip side, they agreed to wipe my rec or semester from the record. So it, long story short, it, I probably graduated about the amount of time and effort it took to, uh, to get where and when it happened. But there was various points along the way where something small could have changed. And I could have graduated a little bit sooner. That was kind of one of them. What did getting a degree mean? Uh, it meant that I was able to go into the workforce and as a computer programmer, actually succeed and work alongside other computer programmers on large scale, world changing projects. Okay, maybe world changing and stretching it a little bit, but certainly country changing or at least province changing projects. That took years of my time, years of my life, years of my st of stress and, and worry on my part and produced a, positive outcomes for the rest of the world. Now, is there anything kind of other than that? I, I guess it's, it's possible that those of you out there in the world who still haven't got your degree, that you can look at me as an example of, yes, you, you can do it, Jeff got it. Of course, there's a little bit of a survivorship bias going on in that particular kind of argument, uh, but it hopefully it can inspire you as well. At least I'd like to hope that that might be the case. Now, obviously things have changed over the past 10 years. There is a difference in technology. There is a difference in how our society works and the number of people who have graduated. I'm just one of many, many millions of people who have a bachelor's degree. I never went further than a bachelor's degree, although who knows, maybe someday. But at least I'm at the point now, thanks to that, where I could if I chose. And if I could find a university and advisor who would accept me and that I would accept in return, that even could happen. So it's, it's something that this, this decade meant to me personally. Another thing that happened this decade is that the, there is a, a whole variety of changes in laws and changes in technology that allowed powerful entities to have a degree of control over the public, other people, crowds of people, their customers that hadn't really been the case in the 2000s. There were powerful tech companies in the 2000s. There was Microsoft existed. I've already mentioned the RIAA. They do have a, an, a side of them that is technical control. A lot of their, their power comes from the government enforcing copyright laws and enforcing people to use or not use certain technology. But I mean, they, they also have some degree of technical control over their, their vendors and the manufacturing process as well. But one thing that really set aside this past decade is that there is a level of control that is becoming possible when you have large numbers of people connected in social networks. Things like Facebook, not Facebook exclusively, but it is conceivable now that the 2016 election, for example, in the United States and the current election, and I think Zimbabwe, I should dig up that link, uh, but elections all over the world are being influenced in a big way by the technology in people's lives, affecting how they perceive the world and the social world and their own government, their place in their society, and so on and so forth. And that there is this degree of power, political power, that really hadn't been expressed prior to this decade. And things happened, like for example, the Occupy movement, where, and that was an attempt at expressing power using technology, uh, an, an attempt at organizing people on a mass scale to accomplish some end. Uh, and similar things have been done both on the side of uh, forces attempting to create a new order in the world and forces attempting to preserve the existing order, or at least uh, make it so that uh, the current government structures, the current corporate structures aren't challenged. Troll farms became a thing. Uh, there were, of course, internet trolls before 2010. Uh, but this is just another way that technology has been developed so that you can manipulate the emotions, the mental state of large numbers of people or the technology of large numbers of people in a scale that just was not possible. And a scale that w wouldn't even have mattered if it was possible a decade ago. Because sure, there were a lot of people with computers. There's probably like, I don't know the exact number off the top of my hand, but I'm imagining it's something on the order of 500 million internet users, uh, maybe a billion internet users, maybe 2 billion telephone users, something along those lines. But in the decades since, we have virtually every human being on the planet has a cell phone. Most human beings have access to the internet. Many human beings deal with their social world, if not exclusively through their phones and the internet, a good part of themselves 
is defined by their interactions through this, this medium that we've built on a global scale. And when we think about power, and when we think about how power is expressed, it would not have mattered as much if every single internet user was swayed in a certain way a decade ago as compared to today. If we can convince every single internet user of something today, that's a big deal. That's a, that's a human species changing event, whereas it really wouldn't have been 10 years ago. And merely having access to the technology, that was the change 10 years ago. Whereas now we're starting to see things like, again, the 2016 election, where it really did matter uh, how you use technology as far as your perspective on that event. And it really did matter whether you're a Windows user or a Linux user or a new Linux user. And it really does matter if the tools in your life are betraying you and millions of other people around you and compromising your ability to reason about the world around you. And as time is going forward, we're also at the same time building tools that get closer and closer and closer to ourselves. Over this past decade, that's been mostly cell phones. Cell phones and the wiretaps that some people see fit to put into their houses for the benefit of the U.S. government. And doorbells, I guess. Uh, there are now surveillance doorbells that, again, record everyone who comes up to your door for the purposes of 100 years of tracing where people have been, who they have visited, and so on and so forth. But these are, to, in my mind, relatively minor to, compared to what's coming. And this is something that has become more and more clear with time, that we are getting, and, and this is something that Facebook has, has put active research into, and has sunk a, a fair amount of resources, although I don't know exactly how much. But we're developing virtual reality. VR is not in many respects new, it's been around for a while, but we have, are, are pointing at, are, are developing towards a full 360 degree control of what you see. There's now haptic feedback gloves, getting closer to feeding information into your nervous system through vibration. But even as of a decade ago, there was research going into brain computer interfaces, uh, tools that would allow computers to communicate directly with your nervous system, your brain, your prefrontal cortex, uh, you name it, work is being done in that direction. And currently it doesn't work very well. There are it's EEG, uh, where basically it's just like the, the mass net effect of all the activity in your brain can be monitored and you can control that a little bit and you can control a computer with it. That's been around again for a little while. But these technologies are slowly starting to move into the direction of being workable. And the combination of powerful entities controlling and being willing to use technology to control people with no thought or very little thought to whether or not they should be doing this. And on the other hand, brain computer interfaces. The two together mean that in the near future, in the not too distant future, we're going to be faced with a problem. And the problem is going to be that powerful entities, maybe governments, maybe corporations, it's not even really clear at this point who is going to be the first to try. But I think it is someone is going to try some entity is going to try to control people right down to the activity of their neurons and to at least re have read access to our brains, read access to our dreams, read access to our memories. And it's going to be marketed as well and as effectively as the wiretaps that people have put in their house. People are going to want this. People are going to think that it's sexy or cool or something that everyone has to have. Or maybe employers are going to require it. Maybe governments are going to require it in order to cross borders or go to school or have a job. Those are the sorts of things, the sorts of ways that it could be made necessary in our life. But at the same time, it's something that I think we should be willing to reject. And that there shouldn't necessarily be a wire directly into your brain, a matrix style or otherwise, controlling you or at least feeding, giving feedback to the parts of your brain that determine who you are. Because that becomes kind of part of the threat, right? Where if you choose to want something, it's because your brain is choosing to want it. And if that part of your brain has a wire coming out of it and someone has right access to that part of your brain and how it fires, then you are no longer in control of yourself. Someone else is now in control of you. And that's something I think that is now thinkable. It is not something that is working now. It is not something we have the technology today to worry about. But I think looking at the decade as a whole, uh, this is something that 
we should be aware of. We should be starting to think on a public policy level about whether this should be allowed and then what leads to that. And if we can prevent those things from happening, maybe we can stop it. And things like, for example, requiring us to give our passwords to the government is a step towards that kind of future, a near-term future. And that has already been put into place, although there's still fights against it, etc. Anyway, the next thing that's been happening this decade is there used to be a bunch of barriers. And I've talked about this in this show. Uh, I've, I've referred to it in the past. So I'm not going to go hopefully too far in depth of it. But there used to be barriers between politicians deciding that they want nuclear war and nuclear war happening. There used to be a barrier between nuclear war even being thinkable as something that would happen anymore. We have peace treaties that are supposed to get rid of that, the chance of that happening. That even regardless of how the government of the United States and the government of Russia disagree on certain topics and certain matters, that they at least work together enough to avoid everyone being destroyed in a giant ball of fire on all sides of the globe, and then the rest slowly dying of radiation poisoning over maybe a couple of months, maybe a couple of days, who knows. It is an event that always was possible. We were taught about, at least I was taught about in high school and elementary school, as something that it could happen. But when Ronald Reagan and his counterpart in the Soviet Union signed some treaties to prevent it, at least it seemed for a while, and then after the Soviet Union fell apart, it did seem for a while, like humanity had at least some barriers between where we are today in our day-to-day -day lives and everyone dying from nuclear war. But some of those barriers have been removed. And again, I, I'll refer to my previous videos as far as the specifics on those, the specific treaties that have been broken and, and left from both the United States and the Russian Federation side. But it's not just that. I mean, the government of China still has a nuclear program. The government of North Korea now has nuclear weapons. And regardless of whether it's negotiating their removal or disarmament or not, the cat is out of the bag and they can produce it. We know they can produce it because they have. And Iran is probably starting to try to get closer now. The world is, is a lot closer to nuclear war today than it was 10 years ago. And we, there were hotspots in, in, or at least uh, periods of time. And I seem to even remember one around 2008 where uh, there was threats of the U.S. going to war with Iran. There was China and the United States were having maybe a bit, a bit of a tiff and things heated up for a little bit. And then they cooled down because there are ways for countries to work together for the differences to be, if not resolved, at least put aside so that they can be, if not resolved later, at least dealt with as, as time goes on. We can learn to adapt to new situations without just reverting to war. But as time goes on, there things happen. And there are periods of time where things get tense, where politicians say things and things happen, people get killed, um, terrorist attacks happen. Uh, all sorts of reasons can cause the relationships between governments to tense up. Relationships with other governments can change and be affected by events. There's a, a lot, a, a very tight web of consequences to possible action. And even something like Occupy could have set off a civil war in some country or other, which could have led to a civil war being intervened by another country. And then that leads to a broader conflict and that can lead to a global thermonuclear war. But the point is that without these safeguards in place, things can escalate a lot quicker. And over the past 10 years, we've lost the ability to stop escalating, to stop that that chain reaction from getting to the very last point. And that very last point is, of course, the nuclear war. Now, that's not, again, the only other thing that that's happened this past 10, 10 years. So there's been a lot of other things as well. One thing that happened, and I should actually double check the year, have this right. This came out in early 2016, kind of a little bit of a blur in my head by now. But that was the lease it all AlphaGo GoMat, which was a triumph of the engineers at Google and computer science researchers leading up to that point, a triumph of AI research, although they didn't tend to think of themselves as AI researchers, ML researchers, I guess, uh, machine language and deep learning. But the important thing here was that there was a machine constructed that took on a human being in a field that was supposed to remain under human control for decades. That if you asked a respectable computer scientist prior to 2016, when will machines defeat humans at Go? 
you would have to find someone who is extremely optimistic about the progress that artificial intelligence was making at the time who would admit that it could be possible by 2060. Most people, I think, at that time did not believe that it would, it would work. That maybe you might manage like a win with a little bit of luck, uh, but a trouncing of a human being and every other human being that's kind of come after them, a consistent beating of human beings in Go would not come for some time, but it did. And AlphaGo, along with deep learning, along with the recurrent neural networks that kind of back all this, uh, it worked. And it was something that was kind of hard to predict, something that you could kind of guess was coming at some point in the future. We get good enough at AI to, to be, have some level of general intelligence, at least in, in a defined scope such as Go. But they really got there. And they got there in such a obvious way that if you watched that match and you could hear the, the commentary of the elegance involved in what the machine was able to do, the human level of creativity, if not more, the level of strategic action that rivaled the best human minds in history, we have built a machine, a, a kind of machine that is capable of kinds of actions and kinds of thought that really we didn't think was possible. And the consequences of this are still shaking up. We are now able to build robots that using this, this technology can do things like replace minimum wage workers, can do things like have self-driving cars. I don't even know if the current technology of self-driving cars uses this, but it's clear that they could. And that given in other couple generations of Moore's law or Kurzweil's law or whatever, we're going to have cars that can drive themselves. We're going to have robots that replace a lot of the menial labor, or could. Again, a lot of this is political decisions. Uh, but things like putting 20% of the global workforce completely out of work and without any hope of ever getting another job is a big deal. And yet this is small scale compared to the possible nearish, medium term effects of this kind of technology. This kind of technology is a was a tr it was a big black swan event that we really don't know what the full impacts are going to be. Maybe it's just going to be a, a, a funny go game and a couple uh, unicorn billion dollar corporations get created and that's it. That's possible. What's also possible is a radical transformation of how we live in the next decade or so, and whether or not we're allowed to survive. Uh, basic income is one way of addressing this problem, and basic income was tried in Thunder Bay, uh, where I just happen to be to observe it. But the important thing is that the AlphaGo game happened and things are going to be different from now on. And they've already started to be a little bit different, but the, fu the future is already here. It's just not widely distributed yet. What else happened? Climate change. Over the past decade, the climate of the world has changed. We have, as far as I understand, gone over the one degree Celsius change over some that arbitrary benchmark that the climate scientists have used and are heading for 1.5 degrees change over again this kind of arbitrary benchmark excuse me still kind of got a little bit of the, that cold from two weeks ago i guess but this has been over the past 10 years something that is starting to become noticeable in my life that i have been alive long enough to have experienced a degree of climate change so Sassboy says that we're on track to hit 1.5 in eight more years and that's believable, given how close we are to it at this point. And there's some discussion about whether or not we should allow this to happen and that it's a big enough change that uh, the, the nation states that exist right now would be negatively impacted enough that maybe we should do something about it. Personally, I don't think there's a hope in hell of not hitting 1.5, given the current political impasse, even before the last big summit. Uh, was kind of torpedoed by both the United States and much of the developing world, including China, that there just isn't the political will to, to meet such a target right now. And as much as I appreciate and, and kind of look fondly on the, the kids who are pushing for such a thing, I personally don't believe it's in the cards. But regardless of whether the 1.5 hits or we hit four degrees or eight degrees or whatever, this past year or this past decade has meant a lot of discussion a lot of heated discussion over climate change. Climate change is now, as I understand it at least, the number one issue separating the left 
from the right and that it's not abortion or religion in classrooms or war in the Middle East or any of a variety of issues it could have been that consistently you can use as a litmus test to tell if someone's on the left or the right in both the United States and Canada and probably elsewhere in the world, but it's their stance on climate change, whether they believe it's caused by humans, whether they believe it is happening at all, whether they accept some degree of responsibility for it, whether they accept some degree of responsibility of what to do going forward, all of these questions now kind of determine what political tribe you're in, which is really not a good thing if you're on the side that believes that it's possibly species ending or at least civilization ending, because you don't really want to get to the point where half the population of the world has some kind of tribal reason to resist you that has nothing to do with the facts, that has nothing to do with the importance of what can actually happen, but entirely based on whether or not they want to stick that last knife in your back, because it's always satisfying to piss off the guys you're not in the same tribe with. And this isn't to say we should just like completely write off conservatives. We are going to have to work with conservatives across the world, including some conservatives we're really not going to want to work with at all in order to address this problem. It is going to require a global response. And short of just killing all of the conservatives, that we're going to have to work with them. And the, the killing of all of them part isn't going to work because they have the guns anyway. Let's be, let's be realistic here. And it would be wrong of us to do it, even if we could. But it, it's just, yeah, let's see what we got from the peanut gallery. 15% uh, reductions in emissions each year, simply not reachable politically. I totally agree. We are still at the point where we're increasing our emissions globally, nationally, on the province, probably in the city as well, here in Saskatoon. Things are not looking good on that side at all. But over the past 10 years, at least there's a significant portion of the world that gets that there is a problem here. And unfortunately, it is mostly on the left. The right is failing on this one hard, globally, locally, everything. It's just, this is their weak point. And it's really unfortunate that this decade is gonna be the decade that we can look back on and say, okay, the right screwed up here on this issue and they screwed up on something so important. Oh, and what else we got from the peanut gallery? This is what politically it's not reachable without the propaganda machine working to reduce consumerism instead of promoting it. Uh, again, the, the fact, fact that they even built a propaganda machine or that, or multiple propaganda machines worldwide in Alberta, locally, eh, the whole thing, that is one of the defining features, I think, of this past decade, that it was worth it that to specifically hone in on that issue because it's something that we, we have to blind ourselves to because it's happening all around us. If I open the window, let's see, hold on. So it's kind of dark out right now, but if you look outside around me, there's barely any snow, which is weird because growing up in the same neighborhood, there would be big snow drifts by now. It would be very cold out and there would be so much snow. And yet this is just not what the weather is like here. And sure, weather is not climate, maybe this year is a fluke, but it's just like last year. And it's similar to the year before. And as we go back in time in this location, it's obvious that something is changing and that the weather patterns have changed and that there are various ways that we can see around the world that things have been slowly but steadily changing. We're way over 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere now. We are, and continuing to increase, but this is something that has been a trend over the past 10 years, that this has been changing. Both the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases, as well as their effects on the temperature of so what else has gone on over the past 10 years? One of the things, on a, again, another little bit of a personal level, is I have been exposed to or been around older people. I have been getting older. The people who are in my class have been getting older. I've got gray hairs now. But over the long haul, especially with older people, people in your life who are getting up there in age, they start succumbing to entropy, to the aging process, perhaps. But you get to see the end of life. And you get to see when big projects or things that are well organized and kept themselves together for quite a while just suddenly fail. I got to lose a hard drive, uh, or at least part of a hard drive, in 2014 and lost a little bit of data, nothing important. Enough to, to rattle me, for sure. But it's the same kind of thing in a way, to lose part of you, to lose 
the aspect of yourself that you bother to record on some writable media and also to lose people in your life. And I have lost both people in my life that are directly in my life, but also people kind of at the periphery, the friends of friends, the people that people around me care about. As we get older, we start collecting more and more and more of these people who are just close enough to the end that they fall off. People like Robert, people like Laurie, people like Maureen, people like Dana, and probably more than I'm, I'm just not remembering off the top of my head, we're lost. And it's, it really wakes you up in a way when you start seeing the people around you starting to keel over and just not be there to respond, not be there to give that last letter that you wrote to them, intending for them to read, not being there to hear the next song that you wrote, the next thing that you created. Quote, Likewise, any and all of your successes, the bugs you find, all that you mind, and everything you eat, all that you can be and will be, and everything under the sun, too, will pass. Entropy will win in the end. Success will leave you, and if you're lucky, you'll live to see it and wave goodbye. And worst of all, the beginning whiffs of the loss of myself is a thing with an organizing principle that at least I can rely on to be there in a predictable way when faced with dealing with an increasingly hard to predict future. That we can count on one thing, and that is that we will die. And that all of the data we strive to save, all of the things we try to keep for the future, all of the fire that we keep burning, it will go out, it will be lost. And I've seen some of it go. I've seen some people, some valuable people in my life leave. And I've seen parts of myself leave and I've been cognizant enough to see it. But that over time you forget things, your brain doesn't work as well as perhaps it could. And unless you practice, unless you continually use the parts of yourself, that are important to you, they will be lost. And memories, the more you remember them, the more detached from the reality that spawned them they become. And you, as an organizing principle, you, as the person listening to this, change Originally, you time slowly but up, gradually, gradually. worn away. The rocks on a beach are slowly ground away. This is just how life is. And this is something that you probably, if you live this decade, also experienced, but I experienced it too. So there's that. Uh, the last couple of things, as we're kind of running out of time here, one of the things I experienced over the past decade is I lived in quite a few places. I've traveled to quite a few places. I've seen quite a few places. And yes, there's a place for me to come at the end of the day, or maybe to stay in all day, a warm place, comfortable place, perhaps. But this apartment is not my home. This side of the city, the east side of Saskatoon, is, uh, I don't really feel comfortable here. I don't feel like I belong here at all. And I can see in the end of this, the year contract, the six months from now, uh, moving into another apartment. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. But there's nothing other than that contract and the expense of moving really keeping me here. It's just the place that I am. And likewise, the place that I was before this place was just another apartment just another, another place to kind of hang my hat and to come to at the end of the day to get things done, that sort of thing. It really didn't feel like a home. And especially with a landlord that can kick you out at any time, it, it just doesn't, there's a level of comfort you, you don't have uh, being as transient <laughs> as I've been. Uh, and so at the same time, I think there is a place that I can call home and that it's something that where I will go, it's something where I will end up. So it's something reliable. It's something that I can always know that it's, it's going to be there for me. And that is that light at the end of the tunnel, that the end to me is the home that I can assume, that I can feel comfortable with, that as long as I live my life well, or, or rather that I can live my life well, because there's, there's just somewhere that I know I will go and somewhere I know I will end up. That is, of course, the end of life. I'll get there someday. Hopefully not soon, though. I have things to do, places to see, people to love, you name it. Another decade, perhaps. But the last thing I wanted to, to kind of point out, 
is, is another one of those personal things. And you might ask at this point, well, why bother talking about all these personal things, Jeff? Like, there's a whole world of things that happen over the past decade. It, groups like WikiLeaks, for example, this is, I think, the first I brought them up. But there are people out there who are possibly listening to this, who might go to university, who might yet make their place in the world and find their place in the world, who are in places and, and mental mindsets where they're struggling with finding who they want to be and where they want to be in life. And that was something I had to face a lot over the past 10 years. And that there was a lot of time where I fell into depression, I struggled, I had to go through what many people go through as they get a new job, uh, transition from one part of their life to the other. But one thing that I think I was really important that I learned was to, to kind of break an old saying from Jella Biafra, don't hate yourself, become yourself. That yes, you can be hard on yourself. And yes, you can make mistakes. And yes, you can be the type of person who occasionally hurts people, or maybe even more than occasionally hurts people, or does the wrong thing, chooses the wrong path, works for the proprietary software developer, works as a telemarketer. And you can look back on that and really see yourself in that negative light. Or you can worry about the future, choose to become a better person, choose to take every possible step you can to change, to become what you want to be. And I hope if you're listening to this, if you go through a period of time where you start thinking really poorly of yourself, and maybe you'll deserve it, to be honest. We all make mistakes. And sometimes the mistakes we make are really serious, especially on the course of a decade. You can really screw up and you can really do things that when you look back on them are painful. You can really do things that make it easy to fall into a pattern of thought where you just don't want to put up with yourself. You don't want to be who you are or you're ashamed of yourself. If you fall into that, try, try to see yourself as something that you can change, something that you can improve, something that you can make into a better person because it's going to take effort and time and work to do it. You're going to maybe have to have access to the internet to do it or other people, who knows, whatever it is, whatever, that's, that's your life. You make a go of it. But that I think is the main takeaway for this decade. I'm going to leave with a quote and then I'll play the goodbye song. I'm not going to make my pitch as usual. We'll talk more about that next week. We are going kind of over, uh, but quote, the darker it gets, the more important it is that you're the shining light. That no matter how bad this next decade is, no matter how dark it becomes, no matter how difficult it gets with climate change, with the geopolitical instability, with our minds being wired or possibly wired with BCIs, with the threat of artificial intelligence looming over us and getting deeper and deeper into manipulating us at a level we can't defend. If you can be that guiding light to other people, it is going to be more and more and more important that you do so. This is in part why I'm, I'm recording this broadcast, why I'm hoping that you're listening to it. Hopefully there's just a little bit of light here that can help guide you. And with that, hopefully I'll see you following this light next week, or actually in the next couple of days on New Year's Eve, when we have our special New Year's show. I'll see you all then.